Lizzie Bright and the Buckminster Boy, Chapter 8 In late September, the sea breeze stole the gold from the maples, the silver from the aspens, the oaks browned, the beeches paled, and, in a general disheartening, the leaves let go, twirled and somersaulted, and finally settled down to sleep. The sea breeze cooled the sun, too, which shone whiter and feebler against aging clouds. Some mornings it seemed to want to sleep with the leaves. On such a morning, not long after the day had finished rubbing its eyes and yawning, Turner rubbed his eyes and yawned to a pounding on the parsonage door. He heard his father's slippered feet hurrying down the stairs. Figuring that only a calamity would fetch the minister out this early in the morning and that a minister's son should stand by his father at such a moment, he jumped out of bed, gathered his robe around him, and went downstairs too. But he could have stayed in bed and still have heard the news Mr. Stonecrop brought since he was hollering it loudly enough to let folks on the other side of the new meadows hear it. Have you read the Portland newspaper, Buckminster? Have you read it? He waved it in front of Reverend Buckminster's face. The Reverend admitted that he hadn't read a single word yet today. Then let me read this for you. Mr. Stonecrop held the paper out with both hands, mumbled a moment until he found the right place, and then began to sputter as though great Lucifer himself had provoked him. Here, the wretch says that he's been forced off the island that has been his home, as though he had any right to call it his home, forced to put his house on a raft. And here, that Phippsburg has never given a fig about him, never even tried to help him or his family, as though we'd never built a school or hired a teacher. And here, he claims that now that he's floated all the way down to Portland, he has nowhere left to go. And that's not all, Buckminster. The moving saga of the Tripp family continues. How they had to tie up at Bush Island after being prevented from coming into Phippsburg. How he had to row back and forth three miles to find a doctor to tend his wife. And how all of this is the fault of the good people of Phippsburg. He stopped and took a breath. The fault of the people of Phippsburg, declared Reverend Buckminster. The insolence of it all, declared Mr. Stonecrop. The trips, declared Turner. Silence in the parsonage as Reverend Buckminster and Mr. Stonecrop looked at Turner for a long moment. You know these people? asked Mr. Stonecrop. You know these people? asked Reverend Buckminster. Turner suddenly wished he hadn't come downstairs. He thought of the house floating down the new meadows with all the trips inside, and Mr. Tripp holding the house together and steady against the waves. Did he know these people? Hadn't he flown with them around the island? Hadn't he made Pearly laugh? But he said, not much. Well, said Mr. Stonecrop, had he set out to deliberately humiliate the town, he could hardly have done much worse. Good Lord Reverend, if this town is going to survive, we need not only hotels to house tourists, we need goodwill to bring them in. And this kind of thing does not bring goodwill. Well, perhaps, Mr. Stonecrop, you are depending too much on... Perhaps, Reverend, if you want a town to preach to, you should begin to use some of that influence we understood you had. We need to be done with this business and done quickly. Write to Governor Plystead this very day. Tell him the situation. I know things move slowly up to Augusta, but good Lord, the state declared six years ago that it would adjudicate Malaga Island. Six years! It's time to get things moving. Tell him that. Well, I, I could write to him. Today, Reverend. Mr. Stonecrop, tourism is at best a chancy business. It is the only business left to us. The only business once the shipyards fail, as they will within a year. Write the letter. Mr. Stonecrop blustered out of the house, and Turner and his father watched him take the street by right of possession. There wasn't a sea breeze anywhere near him, and if there had been one, it would have been trampled into the dust of Parker Head until it wasn't anything but a puff or two. 
Reverend Buckminster stood still, watching the striding Mr. Stonecrop, who had paused by Mrs. Hurd's house and was gazing up at it as if to appreciate its value. A long sigh. <sighs> Go get your breakfast, he said finally. I've got a letter to write this morning, and you've got a hundred lines of Virgil to translate. The lines turned out to be a hundred dull ones, as Aeneas, Turner thought he finally had the spelling down, moped about and looked for a place to live. With Robert Barclay in front of him, it promised to be an even duller afternoon. Turner figured he had had enough of Robert Barclay's tormenting propositions, more than enough to satisfy any human being, and he said so. And, as if to prove that miracles can still happen on a dull day, Reverend Buckminster agreed. When they came back to the study after dinner, his father closed the door, something he hardly ever did, and reached for a volume in the glassed case behind his desk. He weighed it in his hand. He looked at his son as if trying to make up his mind. Finally, he did. Turner, he said, books can be fire, you know. Fire? Fire. Books can ignite fires in your mind because they carry ideas for kindling and art for matches. He handed the book to Turner. The Origin of Species, he read aloud. Is this fire? His father laughed, and Turner suddenly realized that this was the first time he had heard him laugh since they had come to Maine. The very first time. It is a conflagration, he said. Turner looked steadily at him. Should a minister's son be reading this? Well, who better, said his father. Besides, your mother says that maybe... First Congregational doesn't need to know everything we're thinking. He laughed again. Whatever would Deacon Hurd say if he knew you were reading Charles Darwin? Turner felt as if the world was suddenly a more mysterious place. He had never before thought that there were things he ought to be doing that might cause, well, fire. When he opened the book and began to read, he was Jim Hawkins at the captain's chest, Sinbad opening his eyes in the Valley of Rubies, Huck wake himself waking up to a brand new bend in the Mississippi. And it wasn't long before he knew that what he was reading was fire, all right. It was almost like lighting out for the territories. <clears throat> he read with fire in his brain through the afternoon. The next day, he rushed through Virgil so that he could read again. Day after day through the week, he read. The fire heating him, while outside the sea breeze grew colder and colder, and soon there wasn't a single maple it hadn't nipped or a single oak whose leaves it hadn't curled to a Christmas. When Saturday came around, Turner spent the morning with Darwin. He finished in a breathless run just before the three ringing bells and ran down Parker Head, carrying the fire in his hands. He would not warm anyone at First Congregational with it. He had promised his father, but he could warm Lizzie. He was at Mrs. Cobb's by the last toll of the Congregational bells, but Lizzie was not there. <clears throat> Still, the fire burned red in him, and when Turner played for Mrs. Cobb, he marched briskly through the battle hymn, then drove through Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, until it was swinging mighty low and mighty fast. He kept listening for the knock on the back door. It did not come, and after playing long enough for even Mrs. Cobb to shush him out, he waited on the back porch. But Lizzie never came. When she did not come on Sunday afternoon either, the fire in him weakened to a smolder. He played the organ slowly, so that Mrs. Cobb said she had never heard Shall We Gather at the River played so mournfully. 
Well, I'm not about to say my last words this afternoon, Turner Buckminster. No, ma'am. So play something a little cheerier. He played a blood and thunder hymn, and Mrs. Cobb clapped to it. Yes, she said. Those hymns about eternal lakes of fire are always so jaunty, aren't they? Play another. And he tried to find one equally hearty in its pleasures of damnation, but he was smoldering so low that he could not keep the tempo up. Turner felt about as low as a raft set loose on the New Meadows River. Where's that Negro girl been? asked Mrs. Cobb suddenly. <clears throat> I don't know, said Turner. I don't know where she's been, and I'm not allowed to go down to find out, and I don't even know if she's there anymore or if she's gone with everyone else on the island. And Lord knows, they haven't done a single thing that calls for people being so awful to them and taking away their home. And I haven't even said goodbye. If she's gone, that is. He stopped to breathe. Mrs. Cobb looked at him, startled, with eyes as wide as daybreak. You said that all in one breath. I suppose. She nodded and looked down at her hands, gripping her knees. Well, I've gotten to like her, too. Awfully much. I, I didn't say I liked her. Turner Buckminster, you don't have to be a minister's son all the time. You don't have to be a minister's son all the time. You don't have to be a minister's son all the time. Turner had never thought he could ever, at any time, be anything else. The thought shivered him, as if he had almost touched a whale. I, I do like her, he said. Well, of course you do. And it doesn't matter a darn. Yes, old ladies even cuss. It doesn't matter a darn what anyone else in the town of Phippsburg has to say about it. It doesn't matter what anyone else in the whole state of Maine has to say about it. Turner nodded. And if anyone has anything to say about it, it should be me. <coughs> you, Mrs. Cobb? Yes, me, Turner Buckminster. You don't think people haven't been talking about me letting this colored girl into my house to hear you play? Next thing, they'll be taking me down to Powell. Yes, I know all about Mrs. Hurd, that son of hers, sending her to Powell so he can sell her house and invest the money. Well, you think there's any other reason? She shook her head solemnly. Turner stood up from the organ. That's right. You go find out about her as fast as you please, and faster. And Turner... Turner ran out of Mrs. Cobb's house and down Parker Head. He did not see the lace curtains parting or Mrs. Cobb watching him sprinting or hear her humming, I have some friends before me gone. But he felt the sea breeze rolling beside him and he heard the rising of the gulls and he felt the fire in his hands again. He felt as if he were standing on the edge of the sea cliff with the green waves roaring in and their yellow froth churning at the tops. And he was ready to leap. He half ran, half tumbled down past the scrub trees and over the ledges, almost expecting that Lizzie would be waiting for him. And so he was hardly surprised when he reached the shore and she was there. Her arms muddied up to her elbows, a bucket of spitting clams beside her and her dory pulled up against the shore. Hey, he called. She looked up and then back down. Hey, he called again as he came up. Hey, well, I haven't seen you for days. Nine days, she said. You haven't seen me for nine days. Well, nine days then. She went back to her clamming. Well, I could clam with you some. Well, there's another rake in the dory if you want to so badly. Turner went to fetch the rake. What have you been doing? Same thing I'm always doing. They raked together and dug, silently. They raked together and dug a long time, silently. 
Lizzie, are you mad about something? Well now, Mr. Turner Ernest Buckminster, why should I be mad about anything? Well, I guess if there were people in a town trying to take away my home, I'd be mad. Well, I guess you would, but that's not hardly likely. And I guess if they were taking it away just for money, I'd be madder still. Well, I guess you would. And you'd be even madder if you had a granddaddy so sick he couldn't move, and a deacon from the town come down to tell him he had to move anyway. Turner stood over the clam hole he had raked. How sick and Lizzie Bright threw her rake across the flats, sat down in the mud, and began to cry. Turner set down his rake, sat beside her in the mud, and took her hand. Muddy palm in muddy palm they sat, and the sea breeze was quiet. Not even the gulls called out, and Turner did not care if Willis Hurd called down the whole town of Phippsburg upon them. Uh, you done holding my hand yet? asked Lizzie after a season or two. Not yet. Well, you gonna tell me when you're done? Mm, I suppose. She nodded. After a while, this mud will dry so hard we won't be able to get apart. Well, that'd be all right by me. Lizzie looked at him, and it seemed as if she might start crying again. But this time... She'd be crying and laughing at the same time. Well, I guess it'd be all right by me, too, Berner, Turner Buckminster. But what'll we do when the tide comes back in? Go see your granddaddy. And that's what we did. When the tide came back in, they rinsed their hands together in the seawater. And together, they climbed into the dory and rowed to Malaga. And together, they hefted the bucket of clams around the point and up to the house. Lizzie's granddaddy was not sitting on the doorstep smoking his pipe, and Turner felt the loneliness of the place. For a moment, he imagined the trips wheeling out of the woods and flying around them, but there were no trips anywhere on the island anymore. He stretched the fingers of his hand and was surprised that he could no longer feel Lizzie's hand in his own. Is it possible to forget the feeling so quickly, he wondered. Inside the house, it was darker than he remembered, darker than it should have been. Lizzie's granddaddy was propped up in a bed, perched on his angled elbows, so that he could see out the window. Lizzie Bright, he smiled when they came in, and he spoke her name as if he were reciting a blessing. And Turner Buckminster, boy, we've missed you here. No, no, don't go explaining. You don't need to go explaining. We're just glad you're here today. Lizzie handed Turner a knife. You know how to open clams? Well, I will in a minute or two. Oh, you think you'll just figure it out all on your own? No, I think you'll just tell me. You think so? Well, of course I think so. You never can keep from telling me something you know that I don't. Well, then I must be telling you a whole lot all the time because there's a whole lot I know that you don't know. Lizzie told him a whole lot, even after Turner got the knack of it and could open the shell with the point of the knife, slit the mussel before the clam objected too much, and drop it into the pot along with its juice. It was enough, Lizzie's granddaddy said, to make even a man sick in bed look up and take notice, seeing those clams slip out of their shells. But Turner saw that Reverend Griffin couldn't do much more than look up and take notice. And that once the chowder was set to cooking, he lay back down on the bed, exhausted from having propped himself up. He coughed once or twice, weakly, as if he didn't have the heart for it, and then lay too still. Lizzie and Turner sat by the shore while the chowder hottened up. They didn't talk much. They didn't have to. The new meadows was quiet, with the tide slow and careful not to scrape itself against the shore rocks. The gulls rode its back as if for a joke, calling now and again to each other, but mostly just riding the waves up and down, then up and down again. They must have been doing this for more years than anyone could count, thought Turner, and for a moment 
he saw Darwin standing on the bridge of the Beagle and watching the seabirds of the Galapagos and maybe thinking the same thing. How do you think that gull learned to swim like that? He asked Lizzie. Well, his mama and papa showed him. How else? Well, how did they learn? Well, because they had mamas and papas too, Turner. Uh, you know about this stuff, right? Well, but how about the first one? The very first one. What made him start to swim? Well, God took him in his two hands and threw him out there and got him all wet and told him he should stay put. And gulls are still squawking about it. You read that in the Bible? Yeah, somewhere in Genesis, toward the middle. Well, said Turner, standing up, I guess God doesn't mind if he gets squawked at sometimes. Well, I hope not, since I've had reason enough myself lately. She stood too, and together they watched the gulls riding the waves. Then they went into the shack, and Turner helped Reverend Griffin sit up in the bed, and Lizzie brought over a bowl of the clam chowder and fed him. All the time he was smiling, telling them how it was just like Lizzie's grandmama used to make for him. All the time Turner held him up and wondered at how light he was, so light it hardly seemed his body could heft his soul. Whatever would happen if he really did have to leave Malaga? And whatever would happen to Lizzie if he couldn't? Lizzie rode Turner back across the new meadows after her granddaddy finished the chowder. He jumped out and held the dory for a moment, then let it go, and the tide took her out a bit. She turned the boat with one oar, and with the smooth movements of one who knew how, she began to row slowly back to the island. Turner watched her across to the shore, watched her pull the dory up and give a wave. And then she spread her arms out, smiling broadly, and began to fly across the beach, bobbing and weaving until she turned the corner of Malaga and was gone. Turner climbed the granite ledges back toward home. As he climbed, a fire grew in his gut, a fire as hot as Darwin's and maybe hotter. <clears throat> He felt it flaring as he went down Parker Head and flaring again when he passed Mrs. Hurd's empty house and flaring when he passed First Congregational and climbed the porch steps to his house. He felt it through supper so that even Reverend Buckminster stared at him sometimes and Turner's mother dared to break the silence by asking him how his day had been. Fine, he said and burned. He was still burning when his father told him to get ready for the season's last baseball game that evening. Because he couldn't think of a single reason why he shouldn't go, that is, he couldn't think of a single reason he could tell his father, he went and burned on the sidelines, trying not to watch the people who were laughing and passing around bottles of dark moxie and waving straw hats at each other and getting ready to turn Lizzie and her granddaddy off Malaga Island. He wondered that God could let such a thing be. And then Deacon Hurd called to him. Turner, you going to try again? He chuckled, and Willis next to him chuckled, and everyone on the whole dang field chuckled. Turner nodded, let himself get chosen up for sides, and felt the fire burning brightly. He did not lead off. He was set down in the end of the lineup so that it wasn't until the end of the second inning, with a couple of outs, that he stepped up to home and swung his bat low and set his front leg. The days were shorter now, and the white sunlight cold as it settled onto the field and thought about dropping frost. Every tree was blessed with a halo, and the sparkling silver beams slanted down to Turner as he thought about streaking a ball right back up alongside them until it disappeared in the silver haloed glow. Well, you still have that front leg out pretty far, son. You want to think about that? Deacon Hurd chuckled again. Willis, standing easy on the mound, threw the ball into his glove over and over, watching Turner. The holy beams backlit him so that Turner could barely make out his face. He was just as glad. 
Batter up, yelled Deacon Hurd. Here it comes, said Willis, and lofted the ball into the air so that it rose into the silver light and took on its own halo. To Turner, there was nothing but the ball in the sky and the light and the bat in his hands and the fire in his gut. And Lizzie, lofting a rock to him on the beaches of Malaga and hollering at him to swing low to high and the gulls crying and the waves cresting and the rock coming down and him feeling the tingling in his hands as he began to swing. As he swung, he broke his wrist forward and took the ball as if it were as big as a melon and curled it skittering and scattering along the beams of silver light, twirling it foul far, far off into the woods beyond third base, higher than any pine trees Phippsburg might set against it high and far and gone forever. Strike one, Deacon heard, called. No one chuckled. Someone from behind the backstop, backstop threw a new ball out to Willis. He took off his glove and roughed the ball up, then put the glove back on and stared in at Turner, not chuckling, but his face dark as the sun spun down and the beams slanted up. The next ball he threw was higher than the first. With a wicked spin, he put on with his fingertips just before he released it. Turner sidled his front leg a little to the right and watched the ball come, hearing again the crying gulls and the cresting waves. This time, he held his wrists back and sent the ball curling foul back past the first baseline curling away and over the haloed maples and skipping over a gravelly road until it disappeared into a ditch about a county away. Strike two, called Deacon Hurd, and no one chuckled. Another new ball from behind the backstop and Willis roughing it up again. A third pitch as high or higher than the first without a single body of bottle of moxie being passed around, without a single straw hat waving, and Turner waiting, waiting for the ball, and the fire burning in his gut. He broke his wrist again just as the ball came in and threw a roundhouse swing that skied the ball and then curved it foul into the third base trees. Whistles from the people of Phippsburg and shouts of wonder that the minister's boy, the minister's skinny boy, should be able to hit a ball that far three times in a row. But it wasn't three times in a row. It was 12 times in a row. 12 balls hit as high as pride. 12 balls hit as far as hope. Twelve balls curling away as though they were lighting off for the territories. And after each one, whistles and shouts and even clapping for baseballs as foul as baseballs could ever be. Until when another ball was thrown out from behind the backstop, Deacon Hurd called back. How many more you got in there? That's the last one. Well, you lost twelve balls on us said the not-chuckling Deacon Hurd. Oh, I won't lose this one, answered Turner. And he swung his bat and put his leg out and waited for the pitch from Willis, still and quiet. Willis roughed up the ball again. He stepped off the mound for a moment, turned and motioned his center fielder to go out some more and waved his left and right fielders out against the lines. By now, the whole field was in a dusky shadow, and the sunbeams were level and tree-high above them. When Willis began his wind-up, Turner couldn't see his face at all. But the ball, the ball was as big as the moon, floating up into the light, then back down into the shadow, spinning in a way that didn't matter, and ready to cozy up to his bat and then streak on out. And so the ball came down, down, spinning, spinning, and Turner gripped his bat, brought his front leg in, and then 
stepped back from the plate just as the ball dropped, smacked the granite, leaped up, and then rolled to his feet. Strike three, hollered Deacon Hurd. For a moment, no one else said anything. Then Turner heard his father call out, and Willis's friends, and probably most every other soul in Phippsburg, telling him that he should have swung, that he should have straightened his swing out and hit the ball, that he should have, he should have homered. Straw hats were thrown on the ground and heads were shaking. The only one who said nothing was Willis. The only one. When Turner picked up the ball and threw it to him, Willis caught it and turned his face so that the shadow was not so dark. And he saw that Willis was smiling. Turner did not play the rest of the game, which was just as well, folks figured, since they were down to their last baseball. He went back to the parsonage with his mother, walking a little ahead of her. They didn't talk all the way up to the front steps, where they both paused at the top and turned to look across at the church. Now, only the steeple was quickened by the light. And then on down Parker Head, Turner shivered in the shadows, but he wasn't ready to go in yet, not while the light was still on the steeple. So he sat down on the stoop to watch it fade, and his mother stood above him and laid her hand on his head, playing with his hair. You know, Turner, she said quietly, you may have embarrassed your father. Turner considered that for a moment. Maybe, he said finally. Not that I'm so against it, embarrassing your father, I mean. It's good for ministers to be embarrassed now and again. Helps them to remember who they are. Well, I'm not sure the Reverend Buckminster would agree, said Turner. Well, of course he wouldn't. That's when he needs it most. The light on the steeple began to pink. Malaga, Turner thought, would already be in deep shadow, lying low in the water as it did. He had never been there in the dark, but he imagined it now, him standing on the shore and making out the waves only when they broke. Up above, the sky would be spangled, and he would sit side by side with Lizzie and watch the stars fall out of their places in sudden shrieks of light. The gulls would be quiet. The light from Lizzie's house would throw a yellow column onto the sand, and they would move closer together when the sea breeze got into mischief. That's how it would be at night on Malaga Island. The light began to disappear by the far end of Parker Head. The houses were still mostly dark, everyone being down to the Thayer's Meadow, playing with their last baseball. Soon they would come home in groups, talking quietly beneath the naked maples, the striped blankets they had used to sit on now wrapped around their shoulders. The lights would come on and throw their columns across from one house to another, and the coal stoves would be stoked against the coming cold of the fall night as the town settled into evening. That's how it would be at night on Parker Head, where folks knew that, come winter, their houses would still be on Parker Head, not floating down the new meadows. Turner wondered what it would be like to float down the new meadows with his house on a raft, floating to where he did not know. Suddenly, he wasn't so sure about lighting out for the territories. Suddenly, he wondered if having a house wrapped around him wasn't something he wanted a whole lot more. It was sure enough what Lizzie Bright wanted. Turner heard the first group coming back from the game. His mother took her hand from his head and backed up a bit into the darkness of the porch. Don't stay out too much longer, she said. It gets cold so quickly here. Turner nodded, listening to her as she closed the door on the town and disappeared into the house. The group passed, did not wave to him as it went down, on down Parker Head, hushed. Turner wondered what Darwin might have said about the evolutionary advantages of being silent. He figured they might be considerable. He figured he might give it a try the next time he met Willis Hurd. 
Four more groups came by, one after another, laughing as they passed by the parsonage. The last group held Reverend Buckminster, who separated from them and came up the stairs, then went by Turner silently into the house. The purple darkness had rolled farther and farther up Parker Head, rolling in front of it, thin, wispy lines of silken fog that hovered chest high over the ground, like ribbons waiting for racers to part them. When Parker Head quieted, and it seemed that there would be no more laughing groups up from the hay meadow, Turner jumped off the stoop and strode with giant strides down to the street, breaking one ribbon after another, leaving them swirling and reforming behind him, leaving his house deeper and deeper in the purple night, and coming finally to the darkened, empty house of Mrs. Hurd, and seeing someone standing on her porch. He stepped closer and closer still until he was close enough to see who it was who stood there. It was Willis. He was painting the shutters yellow. Turner walked up the porch steps. Willis, it's dark as all get out. What are you doing? Willis spun around at the sound of Turner's voice, but then he turned back to the painting. Well, what does it look like I'm doing? Painting shutters. Gee, you know how to hit a baseball and you're smart, too. But you're painting in the dark. Yeah, I'm painting in the dark. Because you don't want your father to know. Yeah, I told you you were smart. It's for your grandmother. Willis did not answer. He went on with his painting, covering the green shutters with sunlight yellow. Do you have another brush? asked Turner. Willis stopped painting. Why didn't you hit that last pitch? You could have hit any one of those twice as far as the center fielder, but you didn't. Not even the last one. So why didn't you hit it? Because everyone expects green shutters. Willis stared at him. He stared at him for a long time. There's another brush in the pail at that corner, there by the strawberry red. Are you fast? Well, not especially. That's all right, said Willis. You can hit a baseball so high that God can catch it without stooping. You don't have to be fast at painting shutters. Turner took the brush and dipped it in the paint can. He moved beside Willis, painting in the dark. Heaven only knew what the shutters would look like come morning, but they would be yellow again, just as Mrs. Hurd had kept them. He began to paint while behind him the stars glittered for all they were worth, which was considerable, and every single one of them held its place in this night sky without falling. Every single one.